So again, this clip comes on the back of a clip I made about a week ago, which covered some of the key questions relating to mental health that you need to be mindful of for the upcoming exam. I'm going to whip through this. This is a no frills clip, so feel free to pause the video should you want to sort of copy down some of the key points being made here. Okay, so let's start with the biopsychosocial framework as an approach to considering physical health and mental health. So what we need to emphasize here is that we're looking at the interaction of the biological, sociocultural and psychological influences in terms of its impact on your mental health and well-being. So for biological factors, we're looking at things like genetics. For psychological factors, they're internal things such as emotions, thinkings, attitudes that influence your health and well-being. And then for socio-culture, we're looking at external factors. Look for things like bullying, abuse, um, cultural changes because maybe you've migrated to a new country, etc., adjusting to new customs. And the strength of this model is that it's a functional dynamic model as opposed to a static medical model because it's looking at the interaction and how these factors change over time and contribute to our health and well-being. For you stress distress, the first thing you need to emphasize for either is that it's a psychological response. For distress, it's a negative psychological response, such as irritability, anger that can lead to um, withdrawal or depressive behavior. For you stress, it's a positive psychological response, such as excitement or alertness that can enhance our, our functioning. And a key point here is that the body doesn't discern between distress and eustress. So if you have chronic eustress or chronic distress, that's gonna create wear and tear on the body and the mind because of that ex ex excessive arousal. In terms of the transactional model, what determines if we're stressed or not? What we need to focus on here is what do, what do we mean by the word transaction? A transaction is an exchange between two entities. So the two entities that we're looking at here are the external demands placed on the individual and the other side of that equation is the internal coping resources that we all possess. So when we have an imbalance between the external demands placed on us and our internal coping resources, that's when we become stressed. That's when we deem the stress or a significant. So what's the difference between an appraisal and coping? Because before we even start dealing with primary versus secondary and emotion-based or problem-based coping, we need to be clear on what the difference between appraising and coping is. Appraising means gathering information about the stressor itself or the related effects of that. Coping is when we're actually dealing and managing the stressor itself. We're trying to, if we're using problem-based um, coping, then we're trying to deal with the situation itself and minimize that. If we're using emotion-based coping, we're not doing that. We're actually dealing with the emotions connected to the stressor. In terms of primary versus secondary appraisal, and one of the weaknesses of the model is there is overlap here. It's actually difficult to sort of isolate these as two mutually exclusive, um, I guess, entities. So let's focus on how we can actually deal with this in a VCAR sense, in a VCE exam. So when you're talking about your primary appraisal, what you need to emphasize here is the first thing we do is we're gonna basically assess whether it's insignificant or benign positive. If it's one of those two, then there is no secondary appraisal. We're not, we don't have to cope with it, okay? We're just gonna move on. If we do deem it significant, you'll need to emphasize that, and then you're gonna basically evaluate the harm, threats, and challenges associated with that. A secondary appraisal, on the other hand, means we're actually looking at what internal coping mechanisms do we have. Have we dealt with this type of problem before? We also might evaluate our external coping options. Who can we turn to? Someone that we have an existing relationship or maybe there's someone that we don't have an existing relationship that we can actually turn to that might be able to help us. And once we've done that, that might actually, then we might reappraise the actual harm and threats that we actually originally identified from the primary appraisal. And finally, allostasis. Allostasis is an umbrella term that describes the manner in which the brain directs the body to maintain stability in terms of our performance and ability to deal with a stressor through basically triggering large physiological and behavioral changes. In terms of allostatic load versus allostatic overload, there is overlap here. But what we mean by what you need to emphasize when you're discussing allostatic load is due to the cumulative effects of stress that our allostatic response is less effective in dealing with stressors. Potentially, it will be terminated early, but stress hormones will continue to be released in order to help us deal with that stressor.
When we reach allostatic overload, that's when the body breaks down and we might have a physiological disorder like a stroke, an ulcer, a cardiovascular condition, that type of thing. Or we might have a psychological, we develop a psychological condition like a mood disorder, an anxiety disorder, etc. So overload is where we're tipped over the edge and we have a noticeable physiological or mental illness.